this morning, we are going to be, you know, people are flocking to churches this morning all over, and they are celebrating, they are honoring Jesus, his resurrection from the dead. And that's what today is, it's a celebration of that. And every year we celebrate it. And so right now, we are celebrating the resurrection. And sometimes people ask the question, is it important? Is the resurrection of Jesus important? And recently, scholars have started to doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ and become very skeptical of that. And people who call themselves Christians are saying they're unsure if the resurrection truly happened or not. And they're like, I'm not quite sure if Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe he just passed out and then he was entombed and then he woke up. And, and um, so there's many, many discussions about that. This is considered liberal teaching. People who deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he actually died and was risen from the dead. And many pastors are starting to preach less and less about the resurrection of Jesus Christ because people are becoming more and more skeptical and they're like, what? How could a person be raised from the dead? For 2,000 years, we've seen people pass away and pass away. And like, it doesn't matter whether they're a king or a pope or a great leader, they all die. Everyone dies whether they're a pastor or a missionary or evangelist or some great leader or some political leader. Forty years ago in Bible college, one of my professors at the college, there were only two professors, there's only two professors alive out of ten to this day. Um, eight of them have passed away. So this idea of resurrection, because we don't see it every day, people are often skeptical of it. But we are going to be focusing on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. This paragraph is where Paul is making a challenge to us, and he is telling us it is so critical that we believe in the resurrection. And he says, hey, this was testified about in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, there was a prophecy that Jesus Christ would raise from the dead. And this is all according to the scriptures. So first, we're going to go ahead and focus briefly on the seven feasts. And I love to emphasize these seven feasts. So we see here the first feast on the list is Passover. Then there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then there's the Feast of the First Fruits, and the Feast of the First Fruits is what we're going to be focusing on today. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people practiced the Feast of the First Fruits every year. They would offer up their first fruits to God. But this is really a picture of the resurrection. And so in Jesus Christ, we see, oh, the Feast of the First Fruits is fulfilled. And so some people think the Old Testament is important. We only need to focus on the New Testament. But no, we need to first understand the Old Testament. <coughs> Because when we understand about the first fruits, this feast of the first fruits, we can understand more clearly about Jesus' resurrection and how it was prophesied. So here we have a picture of wheat, and it's green, and if it's not summer, it's green. And then the wheat starts to, the barley starts to appear. It starts to peek out. It's that first Fruit. And so the Jewish people, when that first fruit came, they would gather it all in, they would take a portion of it, and they would present it at the temple. They would bring it to the temple or the tabernacle, and they would sacrifice it to the Lord. And that was the first fruits, the feast of the first fruits. They would bring grapes, all the different fruits that they had, all the different produce. And just like the firstborn had to be presented to God, God said, the firstborn is mine. And so this is a practice in Judaism. So Jesus rose from the dead, and he is called the first fruits from the dead. And he is the one. All prior to this, there had never been one that was the first fruits from the dead, but Jesus rose from the dead, and he was the first fruits from the dead. And so Jewish people would say to, you know, would say to people, happy first fruits.
but it's that idea of resurrection, of new life. And so we're going to delve into this a little bit more deeply. And it's the gospel truth. And Oh, instead of spelling out Corinthians, I'm going to go ahead and sign this. Some people, C-O-R, Corinthians. And the reason is because, you know, Romans, people tend to get tired of spelling Romans, Rome in their control. So Corinthians, so Corinthians, or Corinthians is another core. Corinthians, the abbreviation C-O-R is another way to do it. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, it talks about, it's the gospel truth. And Paul explains this gospel truth to us. So let's go ahead and look at his first point this morning. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. The stand firm is what the King James says. So it, it's this idea of standing firm. It's something that you take your stand stubbornly on, that you don't give up, that you don't change. You take a stand on. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. This means brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to remind you, hey, I want you to keep this in mind. Don't forget the gospel. The gospel means good news. Paul says, the gospel that I preached to you, that I shared with you. And people took in that gospel. Which have taken, with that gospel, you have now taken your stand. So you took that gospel and you hold fast to it. You cherish that gospel. You don't turn away from it. You don't go to the right hand or to the left hand. You stand firm in that gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes there are people that turn away. But today, I want to challenge you not to twist and turn the gospel. And oftentimes I meet someone and I ask them, hey, what is the gospel? And most people have no answer to explain what the gospel is. And they're confused, and they're like, um, um, the gospel, um, um, the, the, and Paul is telling us right here, hey, I explained what the gospel means. I was so clear about it to you. This is basically the bedrock of the Christian faith. If you don't have this foundation, your life is going to be a shifting, turning, uncertainty, and you're going to be easily fooled. But the gospel was written here, and it is the foundation of everything we believe as Christians. We need to take our stand in that gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and read. This is the truth that saves us. And this explains how a person is saved. It says, by this gospel, you are saved. Your life is changed. You cannot get saved by going to church. You cannot get saved by living a careful and good life. By following a religion. By being a religious person. You cannot be saved by doing any kind of good work. The gospel has this power. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, The gospel is the power of God to everyone who believes. And Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is through faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ that a person is saved by. This is what the gospel is. If you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Yeah. 
you know, I go into a Christian bookstore, and, you know, there are different ways where people explain how to be saved. And there's step one, you must go to church. Or number two, you have to be baptized in water. Or number three, you have to take uh, the sacraments. Some people believe that you have to do these things to be saved. And there are many different books with many different viewpoints on what it means to be saved. But this verse says, the gospel that saves you, if you hold fast, hold fast to this teaching, what was Paul's teaching? When you understand, hold fast to that teaching. And Paul emphasizes this. When we hold fast to this teaching, we are saved. And we're going to see a little bit more in depth here what he's going to say. So, he said, hold fast. It's, a, it's our life preserver to the word that I preach to you. God's word, the Bible. We are to hold yeah. fast to this. We're not to add theology, religion, different random teachings and just add this on to the Bible. Traditions, no, we're not supposed to do that. We're here to hold fast to the word of God. And that alone is our foundation. God's word alone. I hold fast to it. I keep it firm in my life. I don't twist it to my own men's or, oh, that's wrong, or I don't agree with that part. But whatever the Bible says, I follow wholeheartedly. I hold fast to the word. I don't just follow random new teachings that come up, people who are confused, but I follow the word of God. And then we're going to look at the next verse, verse 2. It says, otherwise, you have believed in vain. If you say your belief is worthless, <coughs> it's very empty. It's no good. Without the word that Paul preached, without the word of Jesus Christ, people are going to be hungry, they're going to be searching, they're going to be looking for the truth, they're going to be looking for a way to be saved. Oftentimes I meet someone and they're like, hey, I've gone to different churches, I've done different things and I'm not satisfied, so I try another church and I'm not satisfied, so I go here and there and here, and I'm not satisfied, and I'm continually searching, I'm unsatisfied. And I'm like, satisfaction doesn't have anything to do with the church. And they're like, wait, the church can't save me? And I'm like, no, the church has no power to save you. And so I open up the scriptures, and I show, and I show them, Jesus Christ can save you, he alone. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through trusting in Jesus alone, and then you are saved. It's critical that we understand this. So churches are not the source of anything, a meeting place. We're just gathering together to fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ to support each other. But to be saved individually, you have to go to God. You can't go to a church. And so sometimes a person says, sometimes a person has believed in vain like this verse talks about. So now he's going to explain what the gospel means. And so sometimes people ask me, what is the gospel? And I tell them, it's so simple. It is not complicated. This verse explains the gospel. It says, for what I received, I passed to you. And that was of first importance. So Paul was saved and he said, First, this is the most this is the first most important thing. Christ died for our sins. Wow. Simple. Christ died for our sins. The gospel. Christ died for our sins. That's good news. Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And there's more. It says, Jesus was buried. So the gospel starts out with Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried for three, and he was for buried, buried, entombed for three days. This is the gospel. This is how we're saved. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was entombed. 
And then the third thing. And third, not only did Christ die, not only was he entombed, but also Christ was raised on the third day. This is the gospel according to the scriptures. This is the good news. So Paul could explain, you know, I am the smart one, and he doesn't, he makes it very simple. Everyone can be humble, even if a person has a very simple mind. They can re realize, oh, Jesus, I can have faith in him. They can believe in Christ. They can be saved. And this is the kind of gospel that we stand strong in, that we don't turn from the right or to the left on. And the world wants to twist it and say, no, Jesus didn't get raised. No, he didn't die. He wasn't buried. And we got to push that aside. We got to focus on what the Bible, God's word, says to us. This is to take priority in our lives. This is the gospel, the good news that was preached to us. I can't even stand anything. These three things are important. And now we're going to delve a little bit more deeply into this idea of the scriptures. According to the scriptures, we see this three times. And Paul has explained the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here we are. We are celebrating the resurrection. And we need to remember these things. Jesus Christ was, he died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. There's like two sides of a coin, you know, like Christ's. We can't have just one side of the coin. All of these parts must come together into one perfect whole, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died and was buried, and then he was risen from the dead. This is the gospel. This is something that we must stand strong in, that we must hold fast to. We are still going to remember, we're going to remind ourselves of the gospel as believers in Jesus Christ. And 2,000 years later, here we are. And now you are here today. The same pages, the same stories. There is no different, no new gospel. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ will always be the same. So this is really important for us to look at the history, the facts that we have to this day. Some people you know, have different doubts about this. Resurrection? Really? Come on. I doubt that. Seriously, that happened? No. But Paul is talking about this, explaining the Corinthian church town of Corinthians. They were seen to be doubting at that time. And Paul showed up and wrote to them this letter. 1 through 58. He expanded on what he had given them earlier. The importance of the resurrection. And the proof. He had facts. It wasn't just something we made up. He had facts to back up his statements. 5 through 11. He talks about the facts. So, Jesus' resurrection. And then he appears to Peter. Now, the corpse. Peter, in other words, also. Simon, the three apostles. Simon, Peter, Campus. They all have the same name. In the Greek language, they are given the same name. So that's a little confusing at times, but all three, they pray to Peter. So he was the first to meet Jesus in the gospel. And you can see this in Mark, Matthew and Luke and John, Mark. They talk about this, how this occurred after the resurrection, who he saw. Jesus saw after the, re the resurrection. So then, he appeared to the twelve apostles. 
First appeared, then he went to the where the, all the apostles had gathered in the home. They, he appeared to them to actually see him. And doubting Thomas, you know, he didn't believe it. No, he hasn't resurrected. He, they were just told, no matter what people told him, he didn't believe it until that day when they were gathered. The twelve were all there, and Jesus appeared. And Thomas was there. And he said, told Jesus, excuse me, Jesus told him to come forward. Touch his body. Touch the damages that had been done to it. And he wasn't a ghost. He could actually, he was physically there. He could touch him and hold on to him. And this is what Peter did before he truly believed. He saw the nails that damage they left in his body and the spear. And he fell down and said, truly, you are my God, my Lord. Truly. Even the twelve that were there, when they broke the bread before or previously, they passed it out. They were watching. Certain afterwards, excuse me, they broke bread and he ate as well. And those were watching to be certain that he could eat it, he could consume it instead of falling to the ground as he did partake. So, and, you know, after he got to the table, people would double check, make sure it stayed within Christ. The same thing when he partook, it was a drink, make sure it didn't go through his body or go through what was before them and wind up on the ground. So he was a flesh. It was true, so it's needless to say, they were shocked. Many had heard that he was in and they believed in the spirit only, but no, he was in body. Imperial, glorified body. Truly, truly. Visible or invisible, he could do whatever he wanted. Go through and appear at any time he wanted in the flesh. People would be startled. He needed to say there would be no room, his doors were locked, but he would appear. And as likewise, he would disappear without going through a door. So the power that he had. So the 12 disciples saw this for themselves. They were witnesses. This is some of the facts of all this sharing with them. So, Peter. And he talks about meeting Peter, meeting the twelve, and after that, meeting the five hundred, five thousand, five hundred people. There was more than five hundred. Maybe five hundred fifty. We're not hundred percent exact accurate, but there was more than five hundred people that witnessed Christ there. And he was there for forty days. Christ was on this earth for forty days. Then on the last day, he ascended into heaven again. And then he told them that he would, in 10 days, he would receive the Holy Spirit, would pour, pour it out upon them. In Acts 2, this is spoken of. 40 days, that period, where he, Christ met over 500 people during that 40 day period. And then most of them who were still living, though some had fallen asleep. So all these people were around Christ. Words of people they could see him. he was teaching lesson once again it was proof again the 12 and saw him as well as over 500 this is proof it's not hearsay that's something made up this indeed had happened and there was so many people who could verify that again it was over 500 people not just 12 there's no room for discussion it's done that happened period there were so many there to witness it and this goes on to say at the same time, most of them who were still living, and some who had slept. Some amongst those who were witnessing Christ were dead at one time. They were Christians though. They had met and they come had come to be with him at this point. And Paul witnessed this and could see this. So he's telling those in the Corinthians, let him know. I saw this. I met Peter. It was so important to establish the church. Peter was to establish the church there. It was the beginning of the church. And people held him in high regard. And he had gone, Paul had gone to him and talked to him. He had shared that experience that he had met Christ. And others who had met Christ. So the Corinthian church, they were satisfied. He went on to explain 
So they made the attempt, satisfied with these facts. And then in seven, then he appeared to James. This is his half brother, if you remember. <laughs> Jesus, he met him. Sorry, he appeared to him. She wants you. Brother. They grown up together. They grown up. They grown up. He was older, maybe by three or four years. But needless to say, they, they rose and raised, were raised together as true brothers. And then on the uh, crucifixion, he was about 33. And perhaps uh, James was 30. So this is really, James has become a really important leader in the Jerusalem, city of Jerusalem. And then he went away with James. When he was younger, he wasn't certain about accepting Jesus. He wasn't certain. But after the crucifixion, that was it for him. He has no doubt. He followed Christ, the word of Christ. And he would say, my brother, you know, sometimes with brag. Ooh, yeah, he, no, he didn't do that. He didn't say, you know, that I was his brother. No. He was there to serve, just as Christ, his brother, was to serve others. And he was there to do just the same, to support Christ. So, it wasn't that he wanted to have prominence amongst the mighty. His brother, he was simply there to give more facts about Jesus. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles who were in doubts. And again, his proof, historical proof, that he did rise from the dead. And the final thing that he appeared was he to Paul. He appeared to Paul. And he had gone to Damascus. And this is where he was taken back, where he was blinded. Saul was going to Damascus. And he was on his dog, he was right, he fell from his horse, and Christ confronted him. Why are you persecuting him? And he was so blinded by his glory. No. He, could, he, was, he could not see. He said, told him at that time to go, leave, and pass this, the word, the fact that he had been met by Jesus. So Jesus saw, Jesus met Paul, and Paul. So 24 years later, served God. But in before that period, he was horrendous, attacking the apostles. And this he speaks, for I am the least of the apostles compared to the other 12. And with those all had been here for three years, had been with him for three years, but Paul hadn't even met him, hadn't spent any time when he was alive on this earth. And he was saying again how insignificant he was compared to the other apostles. But, and you know, do you feel comfortable being called apostle? No, I'm not unworthy of this. No. I was to preach, honor, humbly, serve. I know. You must remember, Paul, that beforehand, persecuted the Christians, would capture them, put them into prison, and there they would be fraught, 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 or killed. This was Paul's doing. His name during that time was Saul, but Saul saw the grace of God, what he had done, which removed Saul of his past life, his, his grace. He could have eliminated Saul and found somewhere else. He really could have remembered what he had done to the fellow Christians, my followers, destroying the church, but no, he did not. He changed him. And in fact, later, when Saul, or Paul at this time, showed up at churches, they doubted that he had accepted Christ. Did he convert? Accepted Christ. They didn't trust him. The twelve disciples, when they come, came and saw that Paul, what he had done in the past, and they had been converted, if you will. Now he believed in Christ. The twelve disciples themselves had doubts. Should we trust him? And they had discussions amongst themselves about this guy. In fact, it was a happy one time. 
the husband and the wife believed. The wife, the husband was taken and killed, and the wife was good. Should I go to eat? And she did. She accepted. The children were tortured and some died. And they weren't certain. They hadn't been certain. Needless to say, when they had converted and accepted Christ. But he goes on to say that I am the least of the apostles, not even deserve to be called the apostles, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He was with me. He moved on from that day forward. The mercy that he had given showed me. Forgiveness that Christ had shown me. This other point this evening is it's absolute truth. So Paul says, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preached and this is what you believed. Whether you're comparing, we're not into comparing ourselves. This is the gospel that we preached. So the 12 disciples and there were 500 people that were eyewitnesses of the gospel. They talked about the crucifixion, that Jesus Christ was died, was buried, and rose again from the grave. And so Paul is saying, we're preaching the same message about Jesus Christ. The apostles are teaching, and my teaching, Paul is saying, are the same. He's saying, there's no difference between us. So consider, if the resurrection didn't occur, this has serious implications. It is critical that it is truth. It is a lo logical necessity that it is truth. And so Paul is going to go on to explain about the logical necessity for the resurrection of Christ to be truth. He says, but if it is preached that Christ has not been raised from the dead, then... How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? This is a conflict. I, I added the word then. Because some people are saying Jesus Christ has not been risen from the dead. And Paul's like, wait, but that's the gospel. Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead. He says, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then that means that not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, so suppose if you believe in these false teachers, if they say Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead in 33 AD, there was no resurrection. If a person says that never happened, there's no resurrection from the dead, that Jesus Christ was knocked out or his followers stole his body and pretended he'd risen from the dead. Paul's saying, no, if you believe that, if there's no resurrection, if Jesus was not raised in 33 AD, if that never happened, he goes on to explain, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. It's worthless. You can throw your Bibles away, basically, if you are unsure about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just throw it in the trash. Don't even believe it anymore. It has no value. You know, if you're skeptical, if you do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you deny the resurrection, the whole Bible is completely worthless. Might as well just throw it in the trash. The resurrection is the bedrock of our faith. And he says, your faith, going to church, all of these things are worthless if Christ was not raised from the dead. Your prayers are worthless. <laughs> but if you, without faith in the resurrection, it's worthless. It's just like talking to yourself. It's like, oh, I believe in like a religious story. It's like this little made up thing. It's, I'm not quite sure if it's true. But as Christians, we need to remember the resurrection is the bedrock of our faith. It is critical for us to believe in this. We must know, we must understand the logical necessity of this truth about Christ. So in verse 15, he goes on to say, more than that, 
we are found to be false witnesses about God. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, if we made it up, oh, we saw Jesus Christ, we ate with him, yes. All of these hundreds of people would be liars. They would be false witnesses. And you remember that's one of God's commands. Um, in John chapter, it says, the devil himself is a liar. And he never has, there's no truth in him. He never tells the truth. And so now if people are saying that they saw Jesus Christ, they would be false witnesses. Wow. The reward of that, their life would be wasted. Their lives would be wasted. So Paul is just like, you might as well just rebel and go live in sin, basically, if you don't believe in the resurrection. But Paul wants us to consider, he wants us to think about this a little more in depth. He says, we have been, if we, we be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. But he did not, but if God did not raise Jesus Christ, if in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. So he says, if Jesus historically was never raised from the dead, if that never happened. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says the Word became flesh. Verse 3, I want us to focus on, it says, Without Christ was nothing made. The universe would be completely gone without Christ. So as Christians, if we take away Christ, if Christ did not exist, nothing else would exist apart from him. We would be, there would be darkness and nothing would exist. But because Jesus Christ has appeared, the universe, the stars, everything is set into motion all through Jesus Christ. And if Christ has not risen from the dead, then none of this could be possible. And so Paul is explaining and he's clarifying the gospel a little more in depth. He says, if, 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 multiple times, if Christ is not raised from the dead, if the dead are not raised, if a person says, oh, it's just a story, the resurrection is just a story. But I want to emphasize this morning how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ is. Verse 17 says, If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. It's foolish. And you are still in your sins. Jesus Christ was not raised. Your sins cannot be forgiven. Adam and Eve's sin is still imputed to you. Your sins cannot be removed without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It means you are still stuck in your sin. There's no end to it without Christ's resurrection. It says, then also those who are fallen asleep in Christ are lost. So a person, if they die, we say, oh, they're in heaven with God. But if a person, if we do not believe in the resurrection, they're never going to be, they're not going to be in heaven with God. They're not going to be given new bodies. And verse 19 says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied more than all men. So I added the then. There's a then here. So then, then, then. He gives the logical consequences of this. If you don't believe in the resurrection, well then we have to take away this and this and the truth of the gospel is made completely worthless. The resurrection is the bedrock of our faith, as I'm saying. Some people are like, yep, Jesus was raised, praise God. But we need to understand, we need to study it. And we need to recognize that if we do not believe in the resurrection, if Christ was not raised, he says, we're to be pitied more than all men. And then he goes on to explain 
the last point of our message, the glorious, triumphant truth. He says, but Christ has indeed been risen from the dead. And he is called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So in the Old Testament, we see the celebration of the first fruits for many years, and then Jesus comes along, and Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. He is the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. When people die, when their heart stops, their soul goes up with Jesus Christ and they are in his hand. And there is a celebration there. So Jesus Christ's resurrection also promises that all who are dead will be raised with him in heaven. Their bodies, they will be given glorious bodies like Christ. And there's some discussion about Jesus Christ's resurrection. And if a soul stays, but I believe that the soul is immediately with Jesus Christ because in Thessalonians, it talks about this. It says, it says, when you die, your soul will be with Jesus Christ. That very moment after you die, you're, with, you're caught up with Jesus Christ. So if I have a heart attack and die, you guys will see and you'll think that I'm dead. For example, oftentimes, you know, I notice like people putting flowers or pictures of where a person has passed away because of an accident, maybe a bicyclist um, was killed or someone, and they put candles out typically. You see this and the flowers, all these decorations, and I see that. And oftentimes I see a picture of many young people all throughout our community. You've seen that too. And we've seen crosses, white crosses, you know, with people's pictures. And I know my time is coming soon. You know, in anniversaries, oftentimes people go and they put, they cry and they pray and they put something there. But is that the person's, where is their soul? So if a person is saved, their soul is in heaven. Their body, their, their body is in the ground. And we do put flowers and things to remember it. Some people actually believe that is where my loved one is. But as Christians, we don't believe that. When a person dies, their soul is immediately caught up with Jesus Christ, and that's what we're celebrating. There was a deaf group, and we went to Jerusalem. And people ask, you know, where did Jesus Christ die? Where was he in tomb? There's a few different answers. Several people have different answers. One person says, this is the tomb. And... Um, was Jesus Christ actually entombed in there? Probably not. No, it just kind of looks like the tomb. And then there's another group, a Catholic church that, or an Orthodox church, actually, that has, they say the tomb of Jesus Christ is there. So there's some argument where Jesus was buried. We don't know where Jesus Christ was for sure buried. We do not know. But the world loves to go and put flowers and honor Jesus, his, his burial place. And the different religious groups like to um, go to these different places. But as Christians, where is Jesus Christ now? He is up in heaven. Where is his body? His body has been resurrected. He has a glorified body. and He has ascended to heaven. So do we pray towards the earth? Do we pray towards the dirt? Are we sad? No, we should look up. Our faces should be up towards heaven. We know there's a time. We know there's joyful celebration. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, they will be gathered together for this joyous celebration, and they will rejoice in heaven. We should be looking forward to heaven. That is where we want to be. We're looking forward to this time when we'll be with Jesus Christ. Our bodies, our bones, everything is going to diminish. Remember Adam and Eve took a bite and God said, You will return to dust. Dust you are and to dust you shall return. 
By those of us who hold fast, we will have a heaven forever with Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. We are looking forward to being resurrected with Jesus Christ forever. The earth will fade away. God will make a new heaven and a new earth. We don't understand exactly how he's going to do it, but he's going to give us new bodies. There's going to be no more death, no more pain, no more crying. But it talks about the shining city, Jerusalem, that comes down onto the earth, and Jesus Christ will reign from this time and forevermore. And so we are looking forward to that. And another verse talks to us and says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said, You believe in God, believe also in me. I am going to heaven to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. I will come again, and I will bring you to myself. This is what we're looking forward to. And because of the resurrection, we have hope. If there's no resurrection, nothing would exist. So some false teachers say Jesus died and his body was disintegrated like everyone else. But I stand firm on what God's word says, how Jesus was raised from the dead. So, we've gone through a lot here. We'll go through these four points again, briefly, real quick. So this is the gospel right here. So that means he died, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead. This is the gospel. And this is the good news. You see, there's no need to be confused about what God, the gospel is. This is it. Three components. Very simple. He died, entombed, and rose from that death. That's the gospel. And that's what we need to hold on to. Not to divert and add anything to it. This, these are the simple truths and facts. It's more historical fact that many people witness the fact that he rose from the dead and he was not a ghost. Talk about poor people and resurrection. Those who believe, believe in Christian life will have that. They also will be with Christ and have a resurrection of their own. Some people say, no, 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 so important for all of us to believe and accept, to accept the resurrection. And please, concluding.